Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on digital evidence in practice. This webinar is being hosted as part of the IGES Institute webinar series. My name is Ashwini Jural, and I currently uh, serve as an advisor to the IGES Institute Executive Director, Maria Cardialis. On today's webinar, I'm joined by Dennis Lowe, commander of the South Central Ohio Major Crimes Unit, and two of the IGES Institute members, um, Tanya Stoffer, practice director from Inova Solution, a member of the IGES and International Association of Chiefs Police Joint Task Force, Law Enforcement Imaging Technology Task Force. And Tanya has also previously served as the IGES Institute Board of Directors and is a longstanding member of the IGES Institute community. Mark Messina, uh, CEO and founder of Revere Technologies, um, an IGES Institute member. Um, and we welcome Mark. Uh, Revere just joined IGES as a member and has been a, a great partner in some of the work that IGES has been doing. So before we start the webinar, a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions, please um, type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer them in a sequence as they come in. If we're not able to answer all the questions, we'll answer them separately to make sure that everybody's questions get answered. Our panelists on today's panel will provide an overview of digital evidence and considerations in implementing the digital evidence management solution, also known as DEMS. Um, some of the findings and the considerations that we're going to share are based on the white paper published by the IGES Institute Law Enforcement Imaging Technology Task Force. How DEMS um, is implemented, and if it's implemented correctly, how criminal justice professionals and can benefit from it. And we are also going to share some of the fundamentals that everyone should actually consider as you're procuring or implementing DEM solutions so you can realize its uh, potential. With the technology innovation and the broader use of artificial intelligence, the digital evidence management solution is making a positive impact and saving lots of time and resources in processing the large volume of digital evidence collected by our criminal justice professionals on daily basis. We know that currently some agencies are still relying on um, thumb drive CDs to collect and share digital evidence, which is very cumbersome process and comes with huge security risk and also can impact the integrity of the uh, digital evidence that you're collecting. So we're gonna cover some of these points and also share a success story from the field. Um, so you can see the value of digital evidence management but also look at the impact of AI and some of the security consideration in today's webinar. So at this point, I will turn it over to our panelists to provide a brief introduction to their backgrounds and present the content for today's webinar. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Tanya. Thanks, Ashwini. Uh, do we have names on the next slide, Phil, or I'll start here. Yeah, go back. Uh, so, uh, brief intro. So, Dennis, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself since you're... Sure. Uh, my name is Dennis Lowe, and I'm the commander of the South Central Ohio Major Crimes Unit. We're a multi-jurisdictional law enforcement task force that's headquartered about 25 miles southeast of Columbus, Ohio, and cover uh, both uh, urban and suburban communities in a five-county uh, area. Uh, I've been in law enforcement for, this is year 40. And 36 of those years have been spent largely in narcotics uh, enforcement. I'm also the president of the Ohio Drug Task Force Commanders Association. Thank you. Uh, Mark, I'll have you go and then I'll, I'll roll into the slides. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Messina. I'm the founder and CEO of Revere Technologies. We're a GovTech provider of cloud infrastructure, compliance, and AI. And uh, we have a particular focus on digital evidence management. I've got a uh, couple decades in uh, large-scale data and analytics, and um, quite a few years of justice and public safety as well. Nice to meet you. I'm Tanya Stauffer. I'm the practice director at Inova Solutions. Um, as Shwini mentioned, we've been a longtime uh, member of, of the Institute since before it was the Institute. Um, uh, but in this capacity, I'm speaking on behalf of the Law Enforcement Imaging Technology Task Force that Ashwini mentioned. It's a cooperative task force between um, IGES and IECP. So, um, I will roll, th roll through that here. Um, so the the portion that I'll speak to today, folks, is the um, the actual the, the white paper that Ashwini mentioned, what the task force produced. Um, it was actually a multi year activity, um, and as mentioned here, it's a it's a joint task force between IACP and and IGES. 
uh, chaired by, so the LEIC, the LEAC, it's governed by the LA Law Enforcement Advisory Committee. Um, Jim Buckley is the um, uh, IGES representative, and then Patrick Doyle from, uh, Patrick Doyle is the um, LEITTF chair from the IACP side. Next slide. Uh, so I'll go through, for the with relation to the white paper, I'll go through kind of the team, folks that contributed, what the challenge was that we saw, the process we went through, and then kind of the recommendations, because that's where we ended up, was just a recommendations, things you should consider before making a purchase. Next. So don't read these names. Go to the next one, but it's a lot of names. Go ahead and flip to the next. This is the profile of those uh, practitioners and other folks that participated in this study. It was a multi-year activity. Um, 10 practitioners, five folks representing uh, not-for-profit organizations. Um, we had nine industry product providers, five service providers, and then the peer reviewers were representatives for uh, on the technology side of things, both within a bureau investigation, prosecutors, and a supreme a state supreme court. So again, those decision makers at the buying level, um, making sure that the content was helpful to them. Next. So we tried to articulate the, the business challenge as a whole um, and then break down the pieces of the puzzle that are um, long running pro business processes within the law enforcement or the just and public safety continuum. So the, the business pillars are the top row there, law enforcement, prosecutors and courts. The business processes are essentially collection, vetting that evidence and then dissemination of the evidence, all the rules around that. Um, and then we spoke to the um, security chain of custody um, as a long running business process, as well as the management oversight of all this evidence. Next. Um, the business challenge might seem super obvious, but we had to articulate it down and narrow it down so that we didn't just kind of try to bowl the ocean. Um, but essentially it was around, I mean, you know, evidence is served, uh, is used to serve the public um, in terms of prosecution or ruling out uh, cases. So it was more around uh, chain of custody standards across the entire system, um, what would be the impact on law enforcement or the criminal justice system if this evidentiary material was accidentally or purposely lost or disseminated, um, who has custody of the evidence at various stages of the life cycle, who are the responsibilities, and then the various perspectives and use cases for each of those stakeholders across the continuum. Next. Um, so we intentionally broke the process up to have folks work on individual silos. Um, so that we could really net out the challenges around each piece of the puzzle. So law enforcement, prosecution, and courts. Um, we looked at the business challenges that are unique to each of those verticals. And then we kind of, we tried to really evaluate what's already taking place in that world today. What line of business systems are generally in place? What business processes already support handling evidence in general? And then try to discuss anything that was unique to evidence that's digital. Next. This is a kind of a visual depiction of how that works. Um, each of those pillars, again, have a very focused process, business process around vetting, managing, disseminating, and disposing of evidence throughout the life cycle of, of a case. Next. Uh, so sources of collection are not just law enforcement, obviously. Um, there are citizen contributors. There are businesses, municipalities, other closed circuit cameras, um, digital evidence, the, the definition in the paper is digital multimedia evidence, and that's a it was a NIST uh, definition that we leveraged. Um, it was specific to any digital evidence that's collected in the in the um, course of a of a case. So, um, copy of a cell phone, copy of a laptop, in addition to just regular citizen video and photos. Um, so the policy considerations were again a lot around which applications and devices are considered safe for collection which applications and networks are considered secure for transfer, how are conversion, redaction, and annotation performed? Again, think about security, um, that kind of thing. Um, and then where should the digital evidence ultimately be stored and how to not make five copies of everything. Next. Um, in the vetting process, um, is the evidence germane to the case? I mean, the normal thing, normal questions you would normally ask in the case of determining prosecution or the ability to prosecute or dismiss. Um, confer the integrity of the evidence, confirm the usability of the data. Um, and then the policy uh, considerations were in the vetting process, verifying the original source has not been changed, uh, and then any authorization to access the evidence and maintaining the audit trail, of course. Next. And then dissemination. So um, various, we, we did find throughout our work that that uh, the, the various verticals sometimes uh, 
don't always consider all of the um, stakeholders in the process. So court IT staff, corrections, evidence techs, all those other pieces of the puzzle here um, and folks that need access to this uh, evidence. And then the technical considerations would again be focused on storage volume audit logging, whether, it, whether the solutions should be centralized or decentralized across multiple agencies, and then the source and the format variety of the, of the evidence itself. Next. And then those, if you remember back to the, the original diagram there, we had the long running business process of management and then chain of custody. So this is related to the management considerations, straight up volume. Um, you know, it's a lot of, um, these, these files are big and they can consume space very quickly um, in, a, in a storage environment. How do we share that information? Again, back to making copies, not making copies. How do we handle that across those different silos? And, and then the cost, the hidden cost um, was very much focused on staff time. Um, these are skill sets and uh, tasks that are not aren't already baked into um, the business processes for the criminal justice continuum necessarily. So especially for smaller jurisdictions, kind of making a determination as to how to best now manage this digital evidence with staff that you have available. And of course, governance uh, is very important to the chain of custody that we'll discuss next. Retention rules and tracking um, and compatibility we discussed as well. Next. Um, so for chain of custody considerations, um, obviously the, the prosecutors are demonstrating proper handling. Um, that's critical to the process in terms of, you know, being able to defend the evidence in a case in the courtroom. Um, but one message we heard loud and clear from anybody that we spoke with along the process and all those steps of the a continuum there is that um, there are already model policies uh, that are that are available if you base them on how to handle physical evidence. I mean, this is core to every uh, law enforcement uh, organization and, and criminal justice process in the country. Um, and so uh, that was the good news is that generally, if you can take the paper process, the physical evidence process, and then apply it to digital, that would be, um, it's a great, great place to start. Um, and then in terms of how many copies to maintain at a minimum, and again, this is a lot of um, NIST input, um, the original copy, a forensic copy, and then a forensic working copy. Next. Uh, and then the, for the conclusion, we really, I mean, again, duh, uh, the need to manage digital multimedia evidence is growing and changing. Even since this paper was first published and discussed, we presented in April at the uh, forum. Um, we've all seen, we were discussing in our prep discussions here, um, we've all seen a fair amount of change even in, even in that short time frame. Um, the underlying process of evidence management remains the same, collect, vet, disseminate. Um, be aware and plan for those budget implications that, that I mentioned, um, you know, space, storage, the staff time uh, to be able to properly manage this information, you know, address FOIA requests, handle the redaction process, um, and, and just be aware of all those things and really ask questions before you make a purchase. And talk to your agency partners. Um, there have been many cases where we have seen or many instances where we have seen um, individual agencies making a purchase that impacts everybody else in their jurisdiction, state, county, municipality. Um, and when they after they made the purchase, there were unintended consequences on their agency partners. Um, so really, really, as much as we discuss collaboration across all these um, organizations, just in general, um, in this particular business problem, it can be a very expensive um, uh, result if you're not walk, working with your agency partners as you go through your, your purchase process. Anything after that? Okay, so I'll turn it over to here to Mark Messina and he'll talk through, oh, actually, yeah, is Mark next or Dennis? Dennis is next. Dennis is next. So Dennis will talk through um, implementation and some of the um, the business benefits that he saw across his team um, in his implementation of his digital uh, evidence solution. Thank you, Tanya. I appreciate that. And thank you to IGES for the invitation to be here again today. And uh, thank you to everybody that's in attendance. Um, so my task force is relatively small uh, in size uh, comparison wise to uh, some of the larger uh, multi-jurisdictional task forces that exist in our state. Uh, but like those larger agencies and task forces, we had a uh, we started running into significant issues related to uh, digital evidence. Um, and all of the things that Tanya's group looked at, which are incredibly important, 
Um, we certainly were just uh, kind of on the uh, the front edge of learning what those consequences were going to be. Um, and I'll just highlight very briefly uh, the, the case that kind of pushed us into this space. Um, in 2018, we worked a uh, large drug investigation and we had a gentleman who was using cloud-based uh, video uh, security in his home. So we had a live Facebook wire going. We were downloading phones of suspects that were associated with the organization that were getting arrested. We had IP cameras deployed on this particular suspect. And then we started obtaining video from inside the residence uh, through his cloud-based uh, video system. And, and at the near the end of the investigation, we had accumulated about 110,000 videos uh, that we had to go through. And I assigned three of our detectives uh, to do that. And it took those gentlemen uh, six weeks and they were doing it eight hours a day to pour through that 110,000 videos. And they ultimately found 54 that were uh, really important uh, in terms of their evidentiary value. Um, but storage of all of that video evidence, storage of all the phone dumps that were uh, um, obtained during that investigation and our other ongoing investigations because everything was just leading to um, mountains and mountains of digital evidence. And uh, quite frankly, like many um, of my colleagues in law enforcement, we were putting everything on thumb drives and external hard drives and trying to put it on servers and uh, in-house and it just became uh, too cumbersome, too expensive and problematic in terms of maintaining the copies and who had control of that evidence and chain of custody issues. So we really started to look at what our options were in terms of finding Dems, uh, a DEM system out there. And although uh, our RMS system, for example, had a uh, evidence component to it, it wasn't robust enough to meet our needs. So we really were looking for something specific uh, that could do that. And we, uh, we identified a system for, for our needs. And one of the big considerations there for us was the uh, thing that Ash Winnie mentioned at the very beginning of this was the AI component. And would this system provide us or offer us the ability to improve our efficiencies. Um, you know, as a small law enforcement agency, every minute counts. And the more time that my officers can spend doing, you know, the physical things that they need to do um, was a paramount concern for me. Um, so we found a system that had really robust uh, analytical components related to artificial intelligence. And just to give you an example, um, that system ultimately, we re-ran re re that entire case through that system. And it found the same 54 videos that it took my three officers six weeks to find. It found them in 10 hours. Um, so that was a pretty telling thing for me. And we've seen that same kind of consistency since then using that system. Um, and it's been really important in terms of how we interact with our prosecutor's office and the exchange of digital evidence, which is involved in every single case that they work now, uh, whether it's a narcotics investigation or regular detective bureau investigations or even patrol incidents now. Um, with the amount of video evidence that's coming from uh, license plate reading camera systems and citizens ring doorbell cameras and you know all of the information coming from phone extractions and their own IP camera systems. So with that volume of information, having uh, something that was able to kind of take that workload off and improve our outcomes was really, uh, really important. And, and we've been uh, managed to do that. And now we've seen those systems even evolve into not just looking at video, but being able to read documents for us, for example, or transcribe audio, um, jail calls. Uh, one of the things that a lot of our detectives uh, do routinely is listen to jail calls uh, after an arrest has been made in an investigation, and our system allows us to plug those jail calls into the system and let the software uh, listen to those jail calls and monitor them for evidentiary value, pull out the important things that it thinks it hears, and then provide that to our investigators to kind of narrow their focus and, uh, and allow them to better uh, utilize their time. So it's been incredibly helpful. And as Tanya mentioned, collaboration and talking to your partners, um, which we did a lot of uh, prior to uh, selecting our particular system. And uh, we've kept that, uh, that communication ongoing. Uh, throughout the process of utilization. We share um, one of the benefits of our task force uh, is that we share all of our technology with all of our law enforcement partners that participate in the project. So um, all of those uh, agencies have access to the same software solutions that we've provided. And it's just been uh, unbelievable in terms of improving efficiencies at their agencies too. And, and quite frankly, and you know, I don't know how much conversation existed when Tanya and her group were working to, uh, to complete their white paper, 
Uh, but I don't know that law enforcement necessarily really ever thought about, you know, uh, how our officers time and what that really meant at the time that they were there. I think, at least for me, I kind of looked at it very simplistically that my guy was here for eight hours a day and he was going to be working, whether he was sitting in a car on surveillance or listening to jail calls and doing those kinds of things. But um, as we got into this project deeper, we realized that there was a much better way to do that. And uh, we found that path and um, we're really, uh, really astounded by the results uh, and how much it's improved our efficiencies uh, in terms of the amount of time that my officers are spending going through that digital evidence. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. Um, and I know they really couldn't live without these products now, and nor could I. So, um, yeah, I think that's a pretty good idea of what we did and how we're using it. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have at the end of the presentation. And I think I'm going to hand it off to Mark Messina. Yes, sir. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Tanya. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mark Messina again, just... Um, Kind of zooming out, looking, talking about some things that I think we all know, and certainly uh, a lot of agencies have felt, um, but just kind of quantifying a few things um, that we know, again, kind of uh, intuitively, but uh, obviously a huge, you know, pervasive staffing shortfalls of the last, you know, four years. This kind of goes back to Dennis's comment there at the end about, you know, the force multiplier and uh, and getting thing, more things done, uh, you know, either with the same staff or uh, getting the the, the usual workload done with a with a reduced staff. But, um, you know, violent crime obviously spiked to 10-year highs, but I think the part that a lot of people don't know is that violent crime is only about 16% of total crime in the U.S. However, as you can see there on the slide, it's about two-thirds of the investigative time and cost. So um, and it is the, the crime that obviously, uh, you know, constituents for, you know, of both sides of the aisle um, have very little tolerance for for violent crime. So it's an area that we generally have unity um, in our country in terms of something that we want to eradicate. Obviously, with you know, reduced headcount and the increased major crime and all the digital evidence that comes with that, uh, it's led to uh, fewer major cases being solved. Phil, if you go to the next slide. So, you know, just kind of, again, recapping, you know, where all this evidence comes from. Dennis touched on the cell phone extractions. I think the average homicide's got about five cell phones uh, that are extracted with it. Um, you know, ICAC units deal with lots of uh, computers. Uh, obviously, CCTV and, you know, IP cameras have been become very cheap as well as high resolution. So a uh, great source of digital evidence for making, uh, making cases. Um, or absolving people um, as well. And then obviously body-worn cameras, which have been around for quite a while now, and uh, and social media records requests um, are all sources. The thing that obviously all of these sources have in common is that it's a lot of unstructured data, which is why it's taking so long to go through the, the tsunami of evidence that's landing on everyone's, uh, on everyone's desk. And it's compounding, right? Uh, next slide. So, um, you know, bluntly, the current processes suck. Uh, there's not a lot of strategy around this that, that, that differs from, say, five or, you know, seven, 10 years ago. So we still see, you know, tons of windshield time. Uh, most agencies still have lots of uh, investigators and detectives, in some cases, very senior people as well, uh, you know, essentially playing Uber Eats with, uh, with evidence, um, whether that's to you know, deliver it to a supporting agency. Maybe they're getting help from their state police uh, or to uh, uh, you know colleagues, obviously like a prosecutor's office and so forth. Um, most agencies are still storing on some sort of internal, you know, file uh, system, some sort of SharePoint kind of system. Um, the thing that I think is uh, sort of lost in that is that while it might be familiar and it might be the way. You've always done, you know, the 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 industry has always done things. Um, File Explorer is like circa 1991, so if not earlier. Uh, SharePoint, by the way, came out in 1999 uh, or 2001. I don't remember which, but right right around uh, turn of the millennia. So, you know, while it's familiar, all of those file folders essentially are like little tiny data silos, and that wasn't a problem with the data volumes that we had in the 90s and, and maybe the 2000s, but I think we can all appreciate that the data volumes are 
have turned into a, you know, again, a tsunami. There's really no other word for it, but the, uh, the volumes are, are not suited to, uh, you know, kind of the old tools and the old way of doing things. So it impacts your, your staff in terms of being able to make discovery within a single case, as well as across cases. And of course, you know, if we apply the old sort of 80, 20 rule, right, probably have 20% of your criminals committing 80% of your crimes, particularly when we start thinking about organized crime and gangs and transnational cartels and, and things of that nature. Um, those systems also lack compliance um, around, you know, whether it's CGIS, uh, which is obviously the table stakes for a solution in this space, but as well as the IRS, um, and many of you might be involved in you know, fusion centers and things of that nature. So there's other uh, other areas where you need compliance beyond beyond just CGIS. So the you know, CGIS with its a growing number of controls, you know, uh, in 591, we were at maybe 615 or so controls. Today we're north of a thousand. So um, you know, keeping up with that compliance is certainly a key piece of any solution um, that's going to meet your needs. And then you know, just a significant manual hours that we already talked about sifting through all this stuff. Uh, and one way to eradicate that is you know, analytic capabilities. Um, I know our focus today is primarily around digital evidence. Um, and and I just, I guess, quick plug for Ash, for Ash Winnie and the IGIS team. I know that there's a an AI summit coming up in September. Um, that I just is hosting in DC that'll obviously focus on that very specifically uh, on that topic very specifically. But um, AI is a way to accelerate discovery, but there's obviously a lot of thought that needs to go into the guardrails of of that of those solutions and and how they're best applied in a space that again requires so much compliance and um, at times garners a lot of uh, uh, public view and requires a lot of public trust. But no, nonetheless, uh, very ripe for uh, accelerating discovery and reducing the number, you know, the manual hours. I think, you know, most most detectives, uh, at least that I talk to and, and most agencies are typically, and prosecutors are typically working somewhere between 40 and 100 cases at a time. If they're working fewer, you know, those that are working maybe 10 or 20 cases are often working the more complex conspiracies. Uh, but their workload, even with fewer cases, and those, those those cases are often stretching a year or even upwards of two years in length. And so the workload doesn't really, hasn't changed at all, even with the lower number of cases. But if we just take kind of 40 to 100 as a pretty good band in terms of the workload on everyone's desk um, and with a lot of empty seats, you know, with the increased, you know, number of retirements the past four years, uh, resignations and and uh, you know reduced recruitment. Um, there's a lot of empty seats. And on that note, I think that there's when we talk about cold cases, the focus tends to every in every most people's mind anyway. You know, we think about uh, you know, 19 some some case from a missing person from 1975 or a, you know homicide from the 80s or something. But the reality is, is we have cold cases being created every single day. Um, because of the the lack of throughput and handling of this evidence and and the ability to sift through it all to figure out uh, if there are dots that can be connected to to make a case and bring justice, you know, and accountability um, into the pub where the public uh, expects it. Uh, next slide. So you know my first the first slide there, you know talked about the uh, reduced headcount and increased you know cases leading to reduced. Uh, uh, rate of case closure. So DOJ actually has 60 years of data mm -hmm. on case closure. And I'm um, just showing there about the last, you know, eight years or so. 2022 data, by the way, is uh, just about spot on in line with 2021. So the narrative hasn't changed at all. You can see the trend line. Uh, we are at a 60 year low in case closure um, for major cases. And, uh, you know, if you want to dive in deeper on, um, certain aspects, you know, look at something like uh, stolen vehicles, you know, motor vehicle theft is uh, it's a very lucrative job for uh, for the criminals that engage in it. It's about a 10% clearance rate. So 90% win rate is uh, very encouraging for them to continue, you know, their enterprises there. Um, we have one more slide. Yeah, and so, you know, this is kind of coming back to uh, Tanya's point um, and the white paper in terms of collection, vetting, and dissemination, uh, we 
you know, this is kind of how we define DIMS and we just break it out a little, the vetting piece out a little bit further, you know, beyond the collection, uh, the storage, again, Tanya talked about, and I think Dennis did as well about the, uh, you know, huge volumes and how quickly they grow. And so being very mindful about where you store that data, you know, how you control that data, um, who owns that data or the metadata associated with that data. Um, you know, securing it, we already touched on compliance and, and searching through it. So those are kind of additional, you know, breakdown of, of the vetting aspect and then sharing. I mean, clearly the criminals, as all of you know, on this uh, webinar, the, the criminals don't care about jurisdiction. They just go wreak their havoc wherever they see fit. Um, and that, you know, induces a huge need to collaborate between um, law enforcement agencies and then ultimately, obviously, with the prosecutors and, and, and courts and uh, corrections and so forth. Um, let's think of there are a couple other points too that maybe I didn't mention, you know, when we think about securing evidence, um, not only, you know, of, of course you're thinking about, you know, encryption and, and things of that nature, but, uh, from a chain of custody perspective, it's worth looking into, you know, the cloud service providers and, and any differentiators there, because we talk about cloud, like it's all homogeneous, kind of like we talk about evidence, like it's all homo homogeneous, but obviously we've got documents and video and cell phone extractions. And even within those, we talk about video, like it's all homogeneous, but clearly we've got different video file types and different codecs and, and all these things that add to all the complexity uh, in dealing with the digital evidence. But, um, but when we talk about cloud service providers, again, another thing that easy to gloss over and think it's homogeneous, but Certainly worth investigating. Um, you know, if you look at uh, CGIS policy 594, 593 or 594, um, they gave a nod to, you know, the fact that some cloud service providers no longer need to, uh, by the way, this is FBI CGIS saying this, right? That, that, that certain cloud providers no longer need to fingerprint the staff in their data centers because they've proven through proprietary um, technology that even if you're in the data center and you can plug into the rack, you can't get access to the data. So they've proven to the FedRAMP board and to uh, DISA around DOD that they have perfect chain of custody. And so, um, you know, what's, where these solutions, which cloud these solutions run on is, um, is just as paramount as the solution itself. So another, another area that it's worth looking into and, um, yeah, I think that's uh, should be my final slide. We're on to QA. Thank you for the time. All right. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Tanya, uh, Dennis, Marcel, we do have a few questions. Uh, so let me start with, uh, um, so I think this one is for you, Dennis. Um, <clears throat> was there a reason um, uh, it, it did not include the Department of Corrections when you were talking about your accused case? Um, are you sure that one was for me or uh, Tanya? With I think that's for the white paper. paper. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the was that Karen that made that first? Yes. That yeah, it was. Um, generally, it felt like uh, we did have the discussion around how to include corrections, and the most of the discussion was around the fact that um, the law enforcement folks that are inside of correctional facilities. Uh, for prisons are also sworn law enforcement. So we felt that the use cases, those folks were discussed in the in the information gathering um, and they were viewed as law enforcement. So any, any activity that would occur within the system, um, within the prisons um, would be captured and discussed as video and captured by those folks in their law enforcement role. Hopefully that makes sense, but it was discussed. Thanks, Tanya. Mm -hmm. um, I know the next question was for Dennis, and Dennis answered it. I think, Mark, um, this is for you or Tanya. Uh, is, um, so the question for Dennis was, is your software cloud-based? And of course, the answer is yes. If so, is it on a CGIS compliant cloud? Uh, do you share the data through the cloud? If not, how? Uh, that's a great question. And thank you, Karen, for asking that. And yeah, that was a big component for us was, uh, you know, what how were we going to do this? Uh, and cloud seemed to be the most reasonable way to get that accomplished, but doing it in a way that was CGIS compliant was also really important. Everybody had a, a lot of concerns about that, myself and the prosecutors and uh, the other agencies involved. So 
Um, yes, to all of that. We do that. It is CJIS compliant, and that is how we share. So, for example, my prosecutor's office has login uh, credentials into the digital management uh, or evidence management system. They're their own credentials, so it's tracking chain of custody for them, but that's how we access it. And I can't tell you how grateful I am that we're past the days of throwing stuff on a flash drive or a CD and my officer having to drive it across town. And then the prosecutor's office would lose it and need another copy of it. And we had this cycle of things happening like that. And this has completely eliminated that for us. Thanks, Dennis. Um, Tanya or Mark, do you have anything else to add to that one? Yeah, I would just say in information gathering on the flash drive, discussion um there was a lot of discussion around from the law enforcement folks who then ended up testifying in court um a concern around defending chain of custody when they were you know driving things across town so um that was a concern so the sieges compliant uh cloud portion is a huge benefit um certainly to all those um just to the to, to be able to defend the evidence in court Thanks. Um, so the next question is, many CIOs are from the private sector and push for new IT systems, such as DEMS, to be run in a CGIS compliant cloud services provided. Have the issue issues around compliance for storage of digital evidence been solved, or is cloud not recommended for DEMS software? Hey, Sean. Um, the, so cloud is absolutely recommended for the primarily for the growth of the storage space and the CGIS compliance issues around, um, there are obviously multiple layers of it, right? There's the policy piece that's responsibility of the, of the states themselves. Um, there's the provider and then there's the software itself. Um, but a lot of those challenges and there are a lot of other, there are a lot of products in the space that address that in addition to um, the integrations that are needed between and amongst all these systems. Um, that is another piece of the puzzle that's um, in motion. Um, there's still a lot of ways to, to solve that one, but the integration between the parts is is the coming tsunami. I just tsunami. chime in that I just chime in that I think since 20 probably 19 or 20, uh, DOJ and FBI have had a cloud smart and cloud first directive, um, as does uh, as does the DoD and. Um, and really federal government at large, um, you know, it's not just law enforcement that has sensitive data, but yeah, uh, and there, the, the um, uh, I think it's OMB or, or some of the IGs are tracking the migration of federal to cloud and uh, certainly prodding them to do that faster, you know, with more, you know, there's the unknown unknowns, right? That sometimes like uh, you might, you might think that what you have on prem is safe, but you got a lot fewer eyeballs, um, I guess, inspecting it than than the cloud service providers do. So, because there's so many enterprises and so many users of cloud, um, as well as white hats and so forth, that are you know red teaming these things, um, they're just uh, they're a little bit more battle tested. Thanks, Mark. And I think that since you brought the cloud first, that not just the federal agencies, but state and local. And then we know that the NACIO, National Association for State CIOs, definitely is focused on cloud for strategy. And a lot of states uh, are moving into the cloud. And we know that a lot of some of the counties have moved their systems into cloud. So um, the next question is, uh, what software are you using? And are you at all concerned with the potential for hallucinations? <clears throat> So I don't know if Mark or Tanya, you want to answer this? Um, I, I can jump in on the hallucinations. Um, you know, the, again, we talk about AI like it's all homogeneous, um, but there are different kinds of AI and different kinds of, you know, application. Certainly the uh, the media has been a buzz about AI since, um, you know, since generative AI came on. The scene, but uh, I think it's I think it's just in the name itself a generative AI. Generally, we don't want to be generating uh, things around um, evidence and, and cases. Um, we don't want to be manufacturing evidence. We want to be investigating the evidence. And so, um, 
I believe FBI now has a, or DOJ has a policy out saying that generative AI is not uh, suitable for, um, for CGIS workloads. Uh, somebody can either back me up or fact check that. But um, but I, again, we talk about these things like they're all um, homogeneous and they're not. There's been other kinds of AI, you know, object detection, auto transcription, you know, things of that nature that have been around for a lot longer than generative AI and are frankly a lot uh, more straightforward for non-technical users to consume and understand what they're what it is that they're. Uh, you know what's being accelerated in discovery, and it's much easier for them to vet whether or not that's that's accurate. So um, I have a question on that. Um, so I know Mark and Tanya and Dennis. I know we talk about AI, and we know for a fact there are a lot of misconceptions in our own AI. And you just used example of generative AI. Can you take a few minutes to talk about this in context of digital evidence? How AI is being used? I know you referenced object recognition, right? So can you shed some light on what are some of the capabilities and what type of, because of course there are different types of AI, right? So when it comes to DEMS, what kind of AI capabilities are being used or what type of AI is being used to make sure that uh, we are maintaining the integrity of the digital evidence, but also as we're processing, we are not putting uh, something or inserting an extra stuff in there. So that can be counterintuitive to this purpose. So can you just take some time to talk about it? Is that for Mark or for me? Both of you, if you guys can. Okay. Ladies first. <laughs> um, so from the business perspective, um, it was the, the the NIST definitions that were mentioned in the paper were around kind of maintaining those original copies. There's a very clear delineation from the FBI's perspective around AI, which is really um, searching things faster and analyzing things faster versus the generative side of things, just as Ashwini was just pointing out. Um, the, the AI uses that we're seeing are things like, um, you know, quickly tagging the evidence to, to Dennis's example, quickly tagging evidence upon ingestion, and then um, looking for um, being able to more quickly search and analyze that um, that evidence in an automated fashion. That's really the AI that's being used um, to currently um, with regards to digital evidence. Um, just saving time, straight up labor exactly what Dennis's example was. Instead of it taking six weeks, it took, you know, 10 hours to um, process that data and look for a specific shape. So think about the consumer uses of AI today. So if I want to go search for, you know, this purple phone case, I can circle it and then I can mash the button and, and return a search result. Imagine if you could do that with your evidence. That's the kind of AI that's available to you in some of these solutions. For sure. Thanks, misspeak on that. Yeah, I would just add that again, sort of uh, classic uh, workflow is, you know, when somebody's got a, I mean, the average cell phone, I think has about 3000 images on it. Um, so, you know, somebody's got to go look through all the pictures on somebody's phone, just clicking through with no triage, no order of priority is not, uh, not an optimal use of um, you know, staff's time. And so being able to prioritize where they're likely to find what it is that they're looking for and work through it in a systematic and quantitative and orderly fashion, um, again, is where the big efficiency gains and force multiplier effect is, you know, often found. Thanks. Dennis, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, you know, just from a layman's perspective, it really, it, it's quite simple object detection that Mark mentioned. Um, and the transcription service that AI performs for us with the jail calls, uh, the video calls and the audio calls, that's really been the, the primary use of AI with respect to our digital evidence management. Um, and uh, it's been just incredibly helpful. You know, we'll type in a search parameter, you know, weapons or a gun or drugs or organic materials or whatever the, the case may be, and let that, that AI go to work on that video and um, it's been pretty successful in finding finding the things that we're interested in seeing. So, um, but those are the two ways that we're using it primarily. And Thanks. one more thing on the applicability of the tools to address problems. You know, Dennis's examples are substantially around investigation, right? If you use the one use case he mentioned was around processing a volume of evidence for the purposes of investigation. Um, there, those same tools can be used though for the purposes of evaluating. Um, evidence to be used for prosecution. And then later, 
making the evidence available to a judge to shorten the just the time frame required in in the court for viewing and um, presenting a case. So the tools can be used, the same tools can be used for all those different use cases. Thanks, Tanya. So the next question we have is, which cloud do you use? Is it a government cloud? Are we allowed to talk about that? Am I, am I allowed to say that, Tanya? <laughs> <laughs> so any F, any CGIS conformant cloud in, in, uh, is going to be able to suit your purposes. I believe that AWS is what Dennis's solutions are based on and Mark's as well. But Azure also offers those solutions. I'm not sure about Google, but I know, I know, I don't know, Ashwini, you would know that as well. Um, but but any CGIS conformant cloud um, can can support these solutions. Yep. So I think to add to that, Tanya, any big cloud provider that has gone through CGIS audits yep. is uh, offering the solution. And uh, again, one thing that we also want to be very clear is that when we talk about CGIS compliance, and we keep repeating this even in our CGIS security uh, um, uh, policy working group, that there's no such thing as compliance. What we talk about is the CGIS audits, right? So anything that you're looking at and where the cloud providers have gone through an audit, to ensure that all the controls or the rules are implemented in a manner that conforms to those rule sets. And the big thing is that, as Mark also mentioned, that we uh, that CGIS is actually adding more controls uh, to this next version of the CGIS policy. And the last count we had in the 5.9.4, we're up to almost 1,300 controls. But the key thing is that they all are there to protect the criminal justice enterprise, the data that we collect, to ensure that there's a proper access and security is addressed. Um, so one of the questions that I wanna ask our panelists is around security. That is the big thing that everybody asks, and especially when it comes to digital evidence, we have to ensure and maintain a security. So what are some of the uh, best practices that uh, digital evidence management solution providers or the agencies are using to ensure that as they implement the DEM solution, that proper security is implemented in the solution, but also when it comes to accessing the digital evidence management. Tony, you wanna go first. first? I'll go first. Uh, I know that there are multiple ways that implementations are going right now. So again, I mentioned, I alluded to earlier to the changes that have happened in the market space just since April, right? It's, you know, July. Um, essentially, you're seeing two different paths that folks are pursuing. One is, getting a purpose-built solution that is designed for the purpose of processing, managing, maintaining, analyzing, and sharing digital evidence. Or they're buying modules that would be added on to something like a case management system or a record management system, that kind of thing. Those are the two directions that folks are going. Regardless of which direction the product solution goes, things like single sign-on, audit logs, search information, those kinds of um, requirements don't go away. So the the maintaining your proper cyber hygiene with regard to user management and all those other things, access management, still the same at rules apply. And if you've got a single sign-on solution for one of your um, implementations, you better go ahead and apply it across this because you need it to be able to talk to each other and maintain your universal um, audit logging approach so you can survive your audits, or not survive your audits, support the needs of your um, FBI policy folks. <laughs> um, but, but those um, just, a lot of it is just the multi-cloud. So, so, so if organizations have their case management system over here and their DEMs over here, that kind of thing, being able to have a solution that addresses on the single sign-on um, multiple places in the cloud is um, of growing importance for sure. Thanks, Tanya. Mark or Dennis? I'll go real quick. I just, uh, to Tanya's point, she's exactly right. And having that single sign-on tenant was uh, really beneficial for us. Um, so that's that's how we're operating ours. And I think she makes a very good point in the direction that you know an agency may choose to go, whether it's with a specific purpose dem system or the modules. Um, and you know, from our uh, experience, we we really felt better about the specific purpose system um, dedicated to this specific thing with this specific purpose. Um, you know, we looked at, and some of my partner agencies have the module systems built in, and even they have expressed some concern that those module systems may not be as robust um, and have quite the efficiencies associated with it that that system that's designed specifically for this purpose does. So I would just say, 
um, you know, because I know a lot of agencies have uh, other systems that use technology and they, you know, they, they're being offered, hey, we can do that too. Um, I would just really encourage you to be very thoughtful in your approach and how you look at that and look at those other systems before you just say, well, we're already with this place. This makes sense. Um, I, I just would really encourage you to, to be very thoughtful in how you approach that. Talk to your friends. Yes. That's talk right. to your friends. Even Talk to people that aren't your friends. Talk to right. <laughs> Well, it, folks that are in the ecosystem, right? Because your decision may have unattended, con- very expensive unattended consequences for others. Exactly right. Uh, Mark, any thoughts? Yeah, I would just, I mean, we could do a whole webinar just on, just on security, but, yep. uh, you know, I guess at the most, um, you know, the table stakes, obviously, end-to-end encryption, you know, FIPS encryption encryption and transit uh you know fips 197 aes 256 at rest um it's not part of the uh not part of the CGIS policy but it is an fbi cloud computing best practice that, you, that agencies should manage their own uh encryption keys so that's something to probably consider when you're you know looking into the various options um and then just you know security in depth which you know all the different Layers of the application, making sure that you've got multiple uh, layers of security within each layer is also something to, to look at when you're looking under the hood. Thanks, Mark. So we have another question. Uh, what process would you recommend for an agency looking for a software vendor that provides an AI solution that can do the tasks described? I would get into, I mean, it starts with requirements. It really talk to the people that are doing whose whose time you're trying to save, and make sure that you're addressing what it is that they do when it you know at their desk on it during a day, um, so that they're not again so you're not having expensive unintentional consequences of your decision when it it sounds super cool and flashy and fancy oh this thing is gonna you know spin on its own and whatever um, to take care of my staff mm-hmm. you know nothing's perfect and there are pros and cons to every decision that you would make. So start with the people um, and, and the folks, it's got to be the business first that's driving that um, decision. Does that help? Sorry. And I, and I think Tanya to add to that, I think it's important to talk to your uh, friends in the field who have already used it and mm-hmm. their experience that you can incorporate as you are looking to bring the solution into your agency, because that's very important. I mean, I always tell people just start with that person that makes you cringe when the phone rings. Yeah. My clients that are on this car here and they are nodding their head right now. Just the person who's like, oh, that's her. Talk to that person about what would make their life easier for them to actually serve the community better, period. I really like the way you describe that, Tanya, in terms of establishing what your requirements are. You know, I think your requirements and maybe your really wants and needs sometimes might not always line up perfectly, uh, but figure out what vendors have those products available to you. And then um, for us, we we did a very extensive test drive uh, with the system that we ended up going with. And we looked at other systems and talked to a lot of other people, but we took it on a, we kicked the tires um, really well with it before we made a final decision. And figure out what you're already paying for. Yeah. You already own. What are you already paying for as a, as a jurisdiction? Um, cloud services, licensing, products, service, whatever. Just figure out what you're already paying for so that you're not spending money on top of money and have an overlap in that usage. I think, and sometimes I think in um, at least public service in my experience, you know, we tend to be kind of reactive and we're looking and, you know, people are going, well, we're doing this and this is working okay right now. It's not been a huge problem. Um, so we're hesitant to expend money or make big purchases and decisions with, for something that, you know, is theoretical and hasn't happened yet. And I would really encourage you to try to break free from that thought process as well and understand that this is an issue. And at some point, if you're not taking steps to address it, um, it's, it's going to have serious ramifications down the road. And since you talk about the down the road, I think what's also we always tell people, folks is that consider the future cost because sometimes we are so get caught into the moment that we are looking, this is a great solution we want to bring in and we don't think about what the future cost will be. So always be mindful and work with your provider 
as part of your navigation. So you have some understanding. It's not going to be perfect, but at least you understand what the future costs are. So you know that you can build that cost into your sustainability plan because we have seen over and over again where the new technology comes in, it gets procured, we start using it, and then suddenly we see that we are not able to sustain it. So that's very important part of your procurement process. Look at the future costs also. Yeah, it's a great point. All right, so I don't see any other questions, uh, but uh, to wrap up, I'll just turn it back to um, our panelists for one last um, thought that you would like to share with the folks who are attending this webinar. So Dennis, I will start with you since I'm seeing you on the screen. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate it. And again, thank you to I just Ashwini and um, for putting this together. I think it's a great topic. And you know the future cost thing that you mentioned, that's certainly a consideration. And I would really encourage folks when you're looking at these systems to try to build relationships with those service providers. Um, you know, the one that we, we have, we have a really good working relationship with that service provider and they've been very open and amenable to even making changes that, at our suggestion. And I know sometimes vendors aren't quite that enthusiastic about making those changes. They're very proud of their thing that came in the box and, you know, they know it better than you do, but sometimes from the ground level, you see things from a different perspective and can be very useful and helpful. So uh, work on those relationships. Thanks, Dan. It's Mark. Uh, yeah, I guess closing comment would be don't uh, don't let your uh, you know, city, county, uh, state, depend who you know who all is on, but don't don't let your agency stack up a bunch of cold cases, modern day, present day cold cases. You know, address the problem, empower your your staff to uh, tackle the volume of data and and, and cases um, and workload that's being thrown at them. And um, I guess I just chime in on, on Dennis and Tanya's earlier comment too about, you know, when you're looking for a solution, like, you know, an adjudicated case, you know, that one that you know from the past, um, you know, run that through a system, see, uh, you know, how it performs and how quickly you make, you make discovery is a good way to kick the tires. Thanks, Mark. Tanya? And I just want, and thanks, yes. I just, for posting this as well, it's just so that the upset. You're welcome. Tanya? Yeah, and um, I mean, my day is substantially around integration, so that's, you know, still where my head goes is making sure that whatever you're purchasing is is touching and not breaking other things that you've already built and you've got in place. Those things are important to the workflow of your staff. You don't want to save them 10 minutes and cost them 20 um, or 30, right? So um, make sure that you're considering those things um, as you go through your purchase process. Thanks, Tanya. So I would like to thank our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to present. If you're interested in attending other IGES Institute webinars or events, please visit the events page on our uh, website, IGES.org. Uh, with this, we will conclude our webinar. Thanks for your participation and look forward to seeing you at other IGES events and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.